A very good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Global Approaches to Case Study in Commerce and Management. I, Sharmila, Associate Professor, Department of Commerce, UG, Indian Academy Degree College Autonomous, heartily welcome you all. My warm welcome to our beloved principal, Dr. E. Jerome Xavier, Professor Shalini, Vice Principal, Ms. Sushma Shri Hachori, Department of Commerce, Resource Persons for the Day, Ms. Chris Saviona Jerome, Dr. F. R. Alexander Praveen Durai, and Dr. Geeta M. Rajaram, academicians from around the globe and my dear faculty members. The use of case studies has become of increasing interest in many areas of education and educational research in recent times. Many educators find that learner-centered cases offer a much more constructive way of teaching in which instructors do not simply transfer knowledge to students, but help them build their own knowledge in a contextual, social, and interactive setting. The process of using cases may also aid in students' abilities to generate multiple pathways for certain circumstances. And in the understanding, there may be multiple acceptable decisions for particular situations. Thus, participating in case studies may help to create more questioning and reflective teaching methodology. I now request our dear principal to address the gathering. Good morning, dear teaching fraternities, research scholars, postgraduate students, and the resource persons. At the outset, I begin my sharing with a note of gratitude to our chairman, Dr. Somshekar, the CEO of Indian Education Group of Institutions, Dr. Srinidhi, and all my colleagues and fellow faculty members. We are living in a period where an air of malaise is all around us due to the panic caused by pandemic situation. And all of us are coerced into activities which we would have otherwise not thought of. Unprecedented uncertainties and bring in umpteen number of opportunities provided we have innovative ideas, creative mind, mental disposition, and willpower to look for new avenues and venture boldly into the unknown arena. All of us are aware the higher education institutions have taken exceptions to these break in our regular routine life and moved from seminar to webinar so that we make use of these opportunities to learn from each other, to be open enough to accept new realities of life innovation in our teaching methods, creativity in all our academic activities. And Indian Academy is not behind from all this. From March 23rd, our institution has been organizing online classes till date and made sure that our students and their intellectual activities are not affected by this pandemic situation. As we hear more often of webinars and attending them, I would not be surprised if we hear a term from conference to 
reverence and wherein we come together once again particularly the teaching fraternity to share our innovative ideas thoughts and to move ahead in the field of higher education keeping in mind quality and excellence as a hallmark i am glad that the department of commerce has organized an international webinar on a topic which is certainly very relevant to undergraduate commerce students students of business administration postgraduate students and more so for the teaching fraternity because case study is one of the best methods for the faculties of commerce and management to teach more effectively what is in the theoretical aspect of commerce and industry we were lucky enough to have resource persons who are willing and who are expert in this field both in india and abroad i am sure you my dear participants will be glad to listen to each one of them and will be inspired by their message and the content they have prepared have a very pleasant day god bless you all thank you very much thank you sir for your inspiring words and your motivation i now request ms sushma shri hod department of commerce to take over a pleasant good morning to each and every one of you joined us in the international webinar before we proceed i request the participants to kindly turn off your microphone and as well as the camera on your device microphone uh, participants kindly note please turn off the camera and the microphone on your device ladies and gentlemen i am much delighted to introduce our first guest speaker for the day ms chris saviona jerome who will share with us her novel ideas and her immense experience in understanding and analyzing case studies on the topic bridging the gap between the industry and academia a case study approach i must say this miss chris may be in her 20s while her profile is very very hefty let us have a sneak peek into her schooling and graduation days she's been confronting challenges right from her early education wherein Despite of her outstanding score of 95% in science she moved to pursue bcom honors at Christ University While at Christ University Chris has shouldered multifaceted roles such as student council member placements coordinator etc In the year 2014 Goldman Sachs in their placement offers picked up the gold from Christ University as operations analyst During her tenure at Goldman Sachs, she has received both senior leadership and client appreciation for efficient management of risk and superior client service. After a couple of years of corporate experience, Miss Chris decided to move from Kannada Nadu to Canada to pursue her MBA from Memorial University of Newfoundland. While doing her masters she received MBA award for her academic excellence for highest academic standing in the graduating class of 2018 She represented Memorial University at the Johnson MBA International case competition and made it to the finals In pursuit of her interest in finance Miss Chris has passed all the three levels of CFA program and her other certifications include Bloomberg market concepts financial modeling to name a few with a well mastered mba and cfa program she joined validus risk management canada 
as an analyst, wherein on account of her robust experience in financial services, within a short span of time, Ms. Chris had a phenomenal professional growth from an analyst to a consultant and currently the associate at Validis Risk Management. Ladies and gentlemen, I must mention this. It's for her commendable oratory skills that she was nominated to be the valedictorian at the convocation ceremony at Christ University, India, as well as at the MBA convocation at Memorial University, Canada. On that note, Ms. Chris, we at Indian Academy and participants from across 13 countries who have joined us in the international webinar today are eager to unlearn, unleash the case study method of teaching and learning. Over to you, Ms. Chris. Thank you very much for those kind words, ma'am. Let me know if you can sh uh, see my screen. No. One second. Let can you do the presentation? Time. Yeah. Is the second time the charm? Yeah. Now we can see Perfect. the PPT. Perfect. Yeah, so thank you very much for those extremely kind words. I am honored to uh, to speak to all of you today. Uh, as ma'am said, I did my bachelor's at Christ University yeah. in Bangalore, and then I moved to do my master's in Canada. And one of my favorite parts about my MBA journey was, uh, you know, learning how to deconstruct the case analysis and participating in international case competitions. So today I'm extremely excited to be sharing all what I've learned with you. My objective today is to give you my two cents on four main themes. One is to understand and discuss the merits of a case study driven approach. And two is to talk about incorporating case analysis and really demonstrating that this can be a very, very seamless approach. I speak about two specific approaches a formal as well as an informal approach where formal approach is structured detailed discussions and the informal case study analysis is just a fun way of critically thinking and problem solving. Before we get into the weeds of case analysis, I'd like to build the case and establish the need for why I think in India we have to increase our uh, you know, case analysis and uh, case study approaches. One is India has the largest youth population in the world. 600 million Indians are under the age of 25. Now that's more than the population of most countries. And I believe that there are three factors that are absolutely crucial to turning India's youth into her competitive advantage. One is ensuring access to education. Two is instilling the spirit of entrepreneurship and three is nurturing a problem solving mindset. And I believe using case analysis solves the third problem where we're nurturing a problem solving mindset. Currently, underemployment is one of the largest challenges that India is grappling with. We all know MBA grads, engineering grads who are doing clerical jobs. And that must stop. And therefore, the onus, I believe, is on colleges and universities to ensure that they are equipping students to think critically and creatively to solve the problems that plague our society. Before we move further, I'd like to spend a few minutes just discussing my experience with the education system in India and in North America. Now in India, I believe we have a push based system where the onus is on the teacher to have a structured curriculum and transfer knowledge. The tools that teachers used to instill knowledge are, you know, textbook driven learning, lectures, exams and assignments. 
And the focus is always a solid understanding of theoretical concepts. And success for a student is measured by their grades or their marks. I call this the KPI, the Key Performance Indicator. In North America, things are slightly different. I've noticed they have a pool-based system for education. So here the onus is on the student to identify one, what their interests are, what they want to get out of the education program. So they have an array of courses and professors involved in different kinds of research. Unlike in India, there is no defined path to achieve a degree. So they have, they're given these options and they can choose, you know, which courses they want, what kind of research they want to be involved in with their professors. So it's more pool based where the student has the initiative. And the focus is the combination of theory and practical implementation. And the tools used are case studies. It's being involved with writing research papers with professors, internships, participating in industry activities. And the measure of success there, or the KPI in North America at the end of a student's program is to see the quality of internships that they've done. How have they um, you know, been involved in cutting edge research? And in my opinion, that's a slightly better approach because it prepares students to transition into the workforce. So one way I believe that we can fill this gap in India of preparing students to transition into the workforce is to use case studies because they're a great tool to build the gap between theory and practice. I've listed some of the merits of a case study driven learning approach here. One is it encourages critical thinking. How would you solve a real problem? It forces students to think about real problems that are confronting businesses and industries today. Second is it is the application of theory to practice. So when solving a case study, the student is looking at different academic research, identifying what specific research is applicable to the problem at hand, and then applying the, you know, the key findings of the research to solve the problem. So it takes the learning one step further, not just an understanding of the theory, but recognizing when theory should be applied in a real world context. It's the simulation of real world events. In the real world, often the right answer is not defined. It's not found in a textbook. So students are forced to think about what they would do when they're confronted with the challenge and when they don't know what the right answer is or how implementing this problem is going to look like. It prepares students for the recruitment process. My experience has been that all of my interviews have all been case study based. So incorporating this in the classroom helps students prepare for a recruitment process. And lastly, it's great Hello. to stay abreast um, of current affairs. So I hope I've convinced you of the benefits of using my, case studies in your classroom. Um, and now I'd like to demonstrate how seamlessly this can be integrated. So I talk about two approaches today. One is an informal approach to case analysis, which is just critically thinking about challenges in a fun way. And two is the formal approach to case analysis. And this is a structured analysis. It involves group discussion, group brainstorming. It's time consuming, but it is also very useful to develop great critical thinking skills. So we'll get into these two approaches. We'll look at some tools that can be used for these two approaches. So hopefully you will be very comfortable integrating this in your classroom discussion. So first, as I said, is the informal approach. This is just daily discussion about problems that confront our society. It's structured brainstorming and it is making problem solving fun and critical thinking part of something that students and professors do every single day. 
I've identified seven questions, and I believe this is all you need to get to the crux of a problem. One is defining the problem that you're currently evaluating. Secondly, how is the problem currently being addressed? So thinking about that. Thirdly, thinking about how a specific product or business or service that you're evaluating is helping or is solving this problem. Looking at the key risks, questioning where growth is going to come from, questioning how the problem is going to look like in the future, and thinking about whether the business model of uh, you know, the company that you're evaluating is flexible enough to solve the problem that arises in the future. And don't worry, I'll demonstrate how easily these seven questions can be implemented to a real life company. So I'm sure we've all taken an Uber at some point in time or the other. Well, the story of Uber is actually quite fascinating. And this was around 2007, 2008. Uber's co-founders, Gareth Camp and Travis Kalanick were based in San Francisco. And San Francisco had a real problem with public transportation. Finding a parking apparently was a nightmare in the city's busy downtown area. So especially when people are going to a restaurant to going to enjoy a night out, it was impossible to find a parking space and take their car. And the public service there was terrible. They didn't have public uh, transportation after 12. And Uber's taxi system was also very inefficient. So what happened was when Gareth Camp, one of the co-founders of Uber, was watching a James Bond movie, what caught his attention was something that he saw on Daniel Craig's screen. So he saw that the actor in James Bond had, um, had his phone, and this was 2007, before smartphones and before apps. So he saw James Bond having a phone which showed an image of the car and it also showed the route that the car was navigating. And immediately something clicked in Gareth Camp's mind and he said, okay, wait, this is the silver bullet. This is a solution that we actually need in reality, not just the movies. So again, the problem he identified was inefficient public transportation and how he how was that problem currently being addressed is that it was expensive and unreli unreliable taxi services with long wait times that was how the problem was currently being addressed and so what Gareth Camper said was wait we can solve this problem just like how James Bond is solving his problem following that car we can have a convenient on the go black cab service that can be ordered on the phone as well as tracked on the phone. So that was how they decided to solve the problem. Now, what are the key risks? So I said there were seven questions. The fourth question is the key risks affecting success. So one is yes, it was a great idea. It was a magical solution to their problems. But the fact was that regulation in San Francisco didn't support their business. So one risk is regulatory risk. So there was the taxi industry where anyone can't just drive a taxi. You have to have something called the medallion. And in order to get this medallion, the supply of which is constrained, it costs many hundred thousand dollars. So it's quite expensive. And what Uber was proposing was to navigate, to circumvent that problem. So that was a risk. They might not be able to implement this solution. Second risk was the reliance on people having smartphones and being willing to download the Uber app on that smartphone. Again, this was 2007, 2008, pre, you know, rapid penetration of the smartphone, but it was a risk that they assumed. And this is how we've identified that risk. And question five, I said, is identifying where growth is going to come from. 
So what they identified, the founders of Uber identified, was that this problem is not just a San Francisco problem. It's a problem in New York. It's a problem in Delhi. It's a problem in Bangalore. It's a problem globally. So they identified that growth is going to come from geographic expansion. And the sixth of the seven questions that I said was to question what this problem is going to look like in the future. Because obviously any business has a long term, if not perpetual objective. So what Garrett Camp and, uh, and Travis Kalanick said was they believe that urban congestion is going to get worse in the future with rapid urbanization. People are not going to have parking spaces in, in big cities. Technologies could potentially have driverless or self-driving cars. And these are all how problems could manifest in the future. And when they were thinking about the business model, one, they decided to have the business model quite flexible. So as you know, in Uber, you have many options. You have Uber Pool, you have the Uber X, which is regular ride hailing. So your Uber X is not driven by a taxi driver. It could be anyone with a car and wanting to uh, wanting to ride for a few hours. And they had these services in addition to their uh, black cab or you know, limousine driving services. So Uber decided that their business model should be flexible to accommodate the, you know, these different types of uh, customers that they're targeting or different areas that they're operating. And Uber also said that because they recognized that you know, there could be driverless cars in the future, what driverless cars would mean is that these cars effectively have spare capacity when the owner of these car is you know is working or is at home and then what they could potentially do is use these driverless cars as uber cabs and therefore they've invested a lot of money in driverless technology so therefore we've seen that uber has ensured that its business model is flexible and this was this was the simple informal discussion all you need to do is just you know pick a business and then tear it apart. And how do you tear it apart? Ask your students or ask yourself these seven key questions. And I hope I've convinced you that, you know, the informal approach to case analysis is just extremely simple and easy to do. And now you're probably asking me, yes, Chris, that's great. We picked Uber, it's easy. How do I get more ideas about things that I could brainstorm on or things that we could get the students to brainstorm on? And look no further, because I have listed a few uh, a few sources to stay current. One is obviously we're all we're all professionals in business management, so business news and staying abreast of current events is absolutely key. The Economic Times I found is a great resource. I also really like to stay current of product launches and podcasts. So there are lots of great podcasts that uh, anyone can listen to. There are some really interesting ones that I personally like. Some ones called How I Built This. It's, um, it's about entrepreneurs, their journey, how they conceptualized the idea and you know implemented that so it just gives you a, a great way of, of thinking about you know a, a specific product and how uh, the entrepreneur you know implemented that product so it's great uh, this uh, there are other podcasts like invest like the best um, which is which talks a lot about business strategy. It's a 40 minutes podcast. If you tune into it once every week, you get a lot of ideas for um, informal case analysis that you can have in the classroom. Another tool that I like is called Product Hunt. It's a platform where new products are being displayed on a daily basis. Again, this is a great way to just stay current. Um, I, I love subscribing to newsletters. Um, there, are some, there are some um industry inv uh, investors like Paul Graham or Bill Gurley. They have great 
thought-provoking articles that they write periodically. So it's 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 very useful to read. And then just books and Twitter are great ways of you know staying current and getting ideas for businesses that you could ask your uh, students to to think about and have this informal discussion using the seven question framework that uh, that I recommended. So the second approach that I also spoke about was a formal approach. Now, this formal approach is obviously more time consuming. It requires more thought, uh, but it is a very fruitful exercise to go through in, in the classroom because um, it encourages students to think about a problem quite logically to break down their thoughts uh, and structure it very well um, so that the audience is able, easily able to, to understand what they're saying. Um, and the formal approach it heavily relies on published case studies. So, you know, it, it's either in textbooks that case studies are published or sometimes even in like research articles and papers, the researcher goes through painstaking detail uh, to compile all of the facts into a case study that you can just, you know, it's a few pages to give the students and then they will use as a base. Sorry for to interrupt, Chris. Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we had one uh, participant with the audio on. Okay. I request participants to kindly mute your microphone on your device. Kindly turn off the camera. Yes, Chris, you can continue now. OK. Can you see? Yes, yeah. so that form which is nice and probably Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, the ideal candidate for. Hello. Uh, yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes, Chris, you can continue. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Now we can see the PPT. Okay. okay perfect. Yes. So what I was saying was with the formal approach, it relies on case studies. Um, that are already published. They're ideal candidates for group assessments. Um, it encourages collaboration and teamwork among students, and it just stimulates discussions and problems and strategies and how those problems can be addressed. And it also um, encourages other questions, other participants in um, in the classroom who are maybe not analyzing that specific case to come up with questions and challenges um in challenges um that could potentially be faced with implementing uh, plans that the group presents it encourages reflection on actual course of action versus what you know the group that's presenting the case study recommends because most often uh, formal published case studies are based on real companies and real problems that they face uh, when looking at a formal case study, I have found uh, three pillars for success. So one is having a solid structure. And what I mean is a structure where the facts are presented and analyzed in a very coherent manner. That's really half the battle one. When you think about the problem logically. The second tool for a great case analysis, in my opinion, is having a a compelling narrative so telling a story how is uh, how is the student articulating what the problem is what the alternatives are and what the solution is and the third uh, the third pillar is separating the problem from the issue so the problem is usually the crux of the matter. The, you know, it is the heart of what's going wrong. And the issue is the manifestation of those problems. Um, and separating both and addressing it is, is extremely useful when, when doing case analysis. Now, in my experience, the first two, so that's the structure and narrative, these are the low hanging fruit. It can be easily learned. There are tools that can help uh, you know, students 
use a good structure and great narrative. I'll get into some of that details later. And this is the easy part. Now, what comes with practice and doing more case studies over time is separating the problems from the issues. So this is something that is uh, that students will only learn by doing. Um, so this is really, you know, getting extremely good at case studies would uh, would involve the third process um, and it and it comes with practice. So it's crucial, you know, to keep doing this uh, frequently as long as time permits so that students get better. We'll get into tools and frameworks that help with the first two, the solid structure and telling a great narrative. In my experience, I highly recommend using this three phase approach for any case analysis. I found it's it articulates the problem quite clearly um, and having having a solid structure makes the entire process much more seamless um, and the student gets much better as they as they keep doing it. So the three phases that I recommend using are phase one is establishing the foundation. So the foundation is setting up the case, presenting the facts clearly. Phase two is building the case. So this is the analysis phase. It's you know looking for evidence of the problem, looking up facts uh, in the case that point to a problem, using different tools of analysis that we'll get through over the next few slides, uh, you know, to deconstruct the problem, presenting alternative courses of action and ultimately a recommendation. And then third is to get into the details about the specific plan of action. So in the foundation phase where we're setting up the framework, it's extremely important that the problem statement is very clearly identified. So this is like a one or two statement that effectively summarizes what the entire three or four page case was about. It all boils down to one problem statement that has to be very clearly articulated up front. And the second part of the foundation is identifying the key issues. So yes, we know that there's a problem, but we know that there's a problem only because it manifests itself in different ways. So there are many key issues. And so listing all of those critical issues out is extreme makes it extremely easy for one the students to think about a solution and two the listener or you know the audience or teachers to 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 be uh, certain that the students have identified what the you know what the main issues are the third part of the foundation is laying out the objective. So what is the student or the group of students trying to achieve? And you know, listing that out in three or four bullet points is absolutely important. And ultimately, as part of phase one, I uh, would suggest stating the recommendation up front. So we know the case, we know the problem, and it'll be great if the students can you know, up front say what the recommendation is so no one is guessing. So phase two of the case analysis is, you know, building the case. So again, looking at close uh, at the facts much more closer using for few tools of analysis, presenting alternative courses of action, and then ultimately a recommendation. And phase three or part three of the case analysis is describing what good looks like looking at an implementation plan. What does this mean to achieve the solution? How much is it going to cost? What is the benefit going to be? What is the timeline for implementation? Spelling all of that out very clearly makes it extremely easy for the audience to, to understand what's going on and is also important that the students communicate this and think about this. It's the sign that you know they've assimilated all the facts very well and are um, and are on the right course of action and ultimately students can present some risks and mitigations again it just shows that uh, they've 
thought about this entire problem very well, They're quite balanced between good ideas, but they also know what those limitations are or the risks are and things that they should watch out for. We'll get into a few details in, of each of the phases now. So phase one, as I said, foundation. So what this would look like, it would look like the first few slides that a student is putting together after reading the case. So what, what their first slide would be a problem statement slide. It's just, as I said, a few statements about what the problem is. Then the next slide, which should talk about the key issues. Again, these are just bullet points, you know, three, four bullet points at maximum that show or demonstrate the manifestation of the main problem. And then the third or fourth slide could be objectives. So objectives, what this group of students are going to present as part of the analysis. So listing that out and making sure those three or four objectives tie back to the key issues, ensure that there's coherent thought process. And ultimately, so in the first phase or the first part of the slideshow, if students can up front say what the recommendation is, then the audience is not guessing. So part two of the case analysis is building the case. So as I said, this is the analysis process where we're looking at evidence so that, you know, this, you know, we have a three or four page case, uh, case that is written up. So looking for more information in that case that specifically alludes to problems um, or alludes to what the source of those problems are and compiling that quite clearly. Uh, understanding the macro environment. So what is the legal environment that the company uh, that's the subject of the case is operating in understanding what the micro environment is. So what are the company's strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are they doing well? So all of that should be wrapped up together in the analysis. Um, as a, after the analysis, it's important to look at now that we've understood, you know, what the company that is doing well, what uh, the company isn't doing well, what environment the company is operating in. Let's look at some alternative courses of action or suggestions. So here comes the big, bold ideas. Uh, we'll get into some um, some frameworks for thinking about this. But you know, should the company acquire another company? Should the company, you know, you know, spin off one business and just focus on a business that's working well? Those are the things that we want to be discussing in the alternative courses of action. And ultimately, we want to be talking about a recommendation. Now we've evaluated three different strategies that this business can pursue. So how do we recommend one? We're not just picking something you know, from a hat, we're going to be using a KPI driven decision making approach. So step one is to identify what those key performance indicators are on the basis of what are we making the decision? Is it cost? Is it profitability? Is it gaining market share? So stating up front what the decision criteria are, keep it again, two or three decision criteria, and then saying we recommend you know, the second approach of the three approaches that we looked at, because the second approach meets all the three decision making criteria that we've identified. So when that's spelled out and packaged that way, it's very, very clear for the audience or, um, you know, the other students in the audience of how this decision was made. And it just demonstrates great clarity of thought. Moving specifically, I promise that I'd look at some tools that could be used for analysis. So internal analysis, I recommend using the business canvas. I'll show you that in a few slides. The external analysis, the Pestel analysis and Porter's FIFOSIS are absolutely great. And financial analysis can be done using, you know, some financial metrics or financial ratios to illustrate the problem. And all of this information is usually found in the case itself. I spoke about the business canvas 
And this business canvas is a tool for internal analysis. So when you're looking at analyzing how the company is operating, uh, what are those factors driving success? The business canvas is a great tool to do that. You're just deconstructing the business and uh, and you know classifying key activities and key components so you're turning a complex business into simple uh, easily comprehensible segments so the first segment of the business canvas is identifying who the key partners are so that's you know stakeholders in di different stakeholders and what their interests are so if um, if the stakeholders it's obviously customers and then it's the employees but depending on the business the stakeholders could be uh, it could be government it could be regulatory authorities um, it could be other companies that this company is dependent on for business and operations so listing all of that and also listing what the interest of each of the stakeholders are is absolutely paramount the second component of the business canvas is, you know, key activities, listing how the specific business or company is solving the problem. What are activities they are doing that's solving a problem which is making their business valuable. The third segment is looking at key resources. So what does the company need? to solve the problems? So looking at resources is helpful in breaking it down and listing it. A value proposition, identifying why a customer would come to that business versus the others. What is their unique selling proposition? Listing that out quite clearly. Customer relationships, how does the, how does the company communicate with the customer? How, what channels the company is using? Is it just doing it online or is it directly interacting with the customers through a sales force? Listing all of that is key. Identifying who the customers are. Customer, all customers are not created equal. Every business segments its customers. So defining how customers are segmented. Is it geographic? Is it based on some income level or gender? spelling that out is very helpful and then breaking down the cost structure what is driving cost for the company and where is revenue coming from so once you know the, once you read the case and then you put your heads together and you know deconstruct the case using this business canvas it becomes very easy to see where problems are how they could be solved, you know, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. Uh, using a tool like this would, would really help with that. So the business canvas was a tool for, exter for internal analysis. The tools for external analysis that I would like to discuss are the Pestel analysis, which is the political, economic, social, technological, environmental and legal analysis again this talks so now with that we've understood what the company does and what it does well it's time to look at now the company is operating in an external environment what does that look like so if we're looking at the political environment is the government stable or is it operating in an instable what kind of subsidies are given so is identifying information like that which can support the business or reject the business is uh, is something that will be um, accomplished through this analysis so that's p political e for economic what is how has the economy performed is it a country where the economy is doing very well then it's obviously positive for the business what does inflation look like in this con in this country identifying any social structures how is income distributed what is the demographics of the com uh, of the country looking at technology how has technology penetrated the economy um, is is tech transfer something that's done? So that's the technology part of the external analysis. And then it's e environmental restrictions. Now, um, you know, every business is becoming very environmentally conscious. So looking at how this country 
views the environment, views environmental policy um, is, is very useful. And then ultimately legislation. There are some businesses that are very dependent on having legal uh, infrastructure to survive and therefore assessing the external environment is um, is is extremely helpful to get a full picture of the problem at hand. Another great tool for external analysis is Porter's Five Forces. I'm sure you're all aware. So Porter's Five Forces talks about what is the bargaining power of suppliers in this industry? So this is more an industry analysis. The, the Bestel analysis was for general uh, you know, external environment. Porter's Five Forces is specific to the industry. So it's looking at what the what the uh, suppliers of the industry look like. What is their bargaining power? How many customers are there? Is it few customers? Then they have you know significant bargaining power, or is the customers quite you know diversified um, and dispersed? Then they have lower bargaining power, which is great for the company. Looking at what the competitive landscape is. How often are substitutes being, um, you know, being introduced in this specific industry? What is the threat that the substitute would replace the business or the product that the business is making? And again, what are the barriers to entry in the industry? And uh, what is the threat like for new ent entrants to come and quickly gain market share? So these are uh, some of the tools. Just to summarize again, we looked at the business canvas, which is a great tool for internal analysis. We looked at Pestel, which is a great tool for macro analysis. And then we looked at Porter's Five Forces, which is a compelling tool for industry analysis. So again, we're still in phase two, which is, you know, building the case. So now that we've done with the analysis, Let's look at alternative courses of action. The putting together analysis shows that you understand the problem, you understand what the company is doing well, and you understand the challenges that the company is facing. Now, with an understanding of that, it's time to come up with a solution. So looking at potential solutions that this business or this company can, uh, can choose. It's always recommended to come up with like at least three uh, three is the magic number, but b between two to four is okay as well. So three different courses of action, and we want to weigh the pros and cons of each. Um, in in terms of thinking about what these alternative courses of actions are, um, there are a couple of tools to do it. One is to just ask the question, where is growth going to come from? Most case studies is centered around growth and understanding where is growth going to come from? How is the company going to increase its revenue, increase market penetration? And one tool that I found extremely useful to answer that question is the ANSOFT matrix. That's the four by uh, the two by two matrix that you could see. It looks at two dimensions to achieve growth. One is products and markets. So growth can come from market penetration, which is selling more, selling existing products to existing markets, or it can come from product development, which is you're selling to existing markets, but you're developing new products. So this could be one solution for the business. Innovate, develop a new product. Another way to achieve growth could be entering new markets with existing products. So that's market development or geographic expansion. That's also a great idea, depending on the case, you know, to achieve growth. And ultimately, there's also diversification, which is new products and reaching new markets. The risk of diversification is much higher. So if this is one of the recommended solutions, then it's imperative that the case for diversification is built very well because it's you know, the highest risk of the four strategies. So I said that's one tool to look at alternative courses of actions, just answering the question, where is growth going to come from? Another way of looking at alternative courses of actions or proposing a solution is just vehicles to achieve growth. So say acquisitions, 
or mergers or strategic alliances using a franchise model to expand and talking about tools like that could be an alternative that is explored when doing the case analysis or some cases may warrant focus and divestiture and there should uh, and that can be recommended as well. You know, the business is doing too much. There is no focus. We have to, uh, you know, sell, sell off or spin off, um, spin off parts of the business that are just not working. And those are the ways to think about alternatives. We want big, bold ideas. And ultimately, the goal of part two of the case analysis to come up with a recommendation. So each of these alternatives should be assessed in terms of their pros and cons. And then, as I said earlier, identifying what metrics we're going to use to drive decision making. So ultimately, we're looking at, say, three strategies, a geographic expansion, um, a new product development um, and say a divestiture strategy, but how are we going to pick one? We want to establish that, okay, we, there are going to be three KPIs. One is we want to gain market share in the next one year. That's one KPI. The second KPI could be we want to minimize the financial cost of implementation. So uh, having identified those two KPIs, then it's easy to come to a solution. So based on the th three or two identified KPIs, the recommended course of action is path two because these three KPIs are met. And spelling that out very clearly is, um, is extremely helpful uh, for both the students as well as the audience. And I said phase three was putting together a plan of action. So this is a time where we discuss what good looks like. We've identified the problem in part one. We've analyzed the problem. We've analyzed the environment in part two. And we've also recommended a course of action as part of part two. And phase three is now coming, you know, putting it all together. How are we going to implement the recommendation? What does good look like? What does the organization look like once this problem is solved? How is this problem going to be solved? And how is this recommendation going to be put into practice? So developing a very clear implementation plan is key. So like, you know, talking about some details um, specifically, what are the timelines? What are the resource requirements? What is the financial cost of putting this plan? What are the benefits? I could say cornerstone ideas. So there are some, you know, key ideas that would really stand out in the implementation plan. So if it is an, um, if it is a strategy to expand geographically, then the cornerstone idea could be acquisition of you know, a specific company. So, you know, your entire plan is dependent on that. It shows that you've really thought about the details. Uh, it shows that you've been creative uh, with the solution. And spelling all of that out is 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 absolutely critical. Um, and I said financials, risk and mitigation is, should also be a part of the implementation plan because what it indicates is that this, like everything is well thought of, like both the upside, which is the benefit to the company as well as the potential downside. You know, what should the company watch out for in terms of risk? How are they going to deal with the risk? Is it going to be mitigated or assumed? And that will really wrap up phase three. And that also wraps up, um, you know, the tools that I thought would be helpful to discover uh, and to, uh, to talk about with you. I hope you found it helpful just to summarize uh, what we've gone through. We've discussed the merits of a case study driven approach. I hope I've convinced you that, you know, case analysis in the classroom is great. We looked at both formal as well as the informal approach to case analysis. We said informal is extremely easy to do. All we need is seven magical questions to get to the heart of a problem. And this can be fun. This can be, uh, you know, this can be intellectually 
stimulating activity at the same time it doesn't have to be very time consuming because it's just answering seven questions we also looked at the formal approach to case study this is more detailed it's time consuming it's you know group based um, and it's structured we said that there were three key tools to have a great uh, you know, formal assessment of a case study. We want a solid structure, and then we discussed the solid structure. So we discussed having three parts. That's part one, two, and three. The uh, you, know, you know, deciding the problem and the issues, looking at the analysis, and ultimately an implementation plan. Um, we looked at some tools that could be used as part of the case studies. We said the business canvas was a great tool for internal analysis, external analysis tools. We looked at the Porter's Five Forces for industry analysis, and we looked at uh, Pestel for macroeconomic analysis. And we said that with these tools and with this structure, we should have a compelling narrative to deliver an outstanding assessment of case study and ultimately with practice comes uh, you know where comes much more maturity in looking at case analysis and also the ability to very clearly separate the problem from the issue and this what we identified was the crux of uh, having an outstanding case delivery so that was it for me i'm happy to take any questions that you have chris before we pro proceed yes yeah uh, i would like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Srinidhi Parthasarathy, Chief Operating Officer, Indian Academy Group of Institutions. He's joined us in this session. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think then we can take some questions. Yes, sir, you have something to tell us. Yes, sir. Dr. Sri. Yeah, yeah. Good morning to you. Good morning, Good. sir. You would like to address something? Nothing, nothing. You can go on. It was a great presentation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, at the outset, uh, Chris, a lot of applauds and uh, compliments are flowing in in uh, chat box of Google Meet as well as Facebook. Thank you for sharing those tools which you've referred and used over a period of time. Certainly, it was a great presentation. Uh, I would like to understand um, at an elementary level, now coming from UG background, if I have to handle UG background of students, how do we really make it very, very elementary? Your presentation was very structured. However, I would like to understand how do we make it very simplified and bring in that basics of case study to our undergraduate students to begin with? Yeah. So I think there are two things. One is it depends on the subject and it um, and then it depends on you know the levels to so say and let's look at it one by one. So if it's subjects, there are obviously some subjects that just lend themselves, uh, you know, to, much better to case studies. So for example, any kind of business strategy class, um, uh, you're automatically going to have um, more conversations around case studies. So this could be involved then. But even otherwise, um, I think the informal approach is is quite elementary. Just looking at those seven questions um, and keeping it in mind as you as you think about small things. To so say, you know, the, the, if there's a recent article about Amazon entering India now. This is something that's affecting anyone, uh, whether it is an undergrad student or a parent. So, you know, these are issues that 
you know, ev like everyone's thinking about because they are quite current. So having, uh, you know, smaller discussions or starting off with smaller discussions around news events, I think is is a great starting point and it, you know, helps students to to think about uh, to think about these problems, and then, as you said, ma'am, um, you know, as uh, you know, as this kind of um, this exercise is continued in in classrooms, say maybe in the, the end of the second year or third year, students are now much more better positioned to put together something more formally, and it doesn't have to. You don't have to use all the tools that I just said. Uh, you know, if, even if we just strip away the tools if we're just you know coming back to the basics of three building blocks giving a student what the problem is so the problem is uh, you know right now it's it's covid restaurants are not able to operate because people are not willing to come to a restaurant so that's the problem and then they could look at so that that's that's step one already that they've, the problem is defined and then they, they look at step two which is you know analyzing potential solutions so they say okay people are not coming to the restaurant I mean, what are a few ideas home delivery or um, you know setting up an outdoor like few tables outdoors so looking at it just in terms of um, very basic alternatives not going through the details of the tools and then ultimately you know coming up with a solution but saying on the basis of what you know the, has the student made that solution so just those casual conversations uh, i think are a great starting point to just uh, encourage students to start thinking about this and then maybe later on you could get to a more structured approach using uh, you know some of the tools that i've highlighted thank you chris there's one uh, request from uh, Mr. Ramesh Shetty. He's asking you to suggest one good book that we could refer, or a couple yeah. of books rather, for yeah. case studies. So um, I actually refer to you know, the Harvard Business Review. They have they publish a lot of case studies. Um, I've I've never used books because one I've not found this kind of information in in a textbook. Um, so Harvard publishes a lot of case studies. There's an uh, there's another publication. It's Ivy Ivy Business School. So they publish a lot of case studies as well, and it's you know just it's quite simple, a few pages with some supporting material. Um, that's great. And like Howard and Ivy are great for this, this structured approach because they have like few pages, uh, you know, someone collects all of the facts. They have an appendix with supporting information. That's all you need to analyze it. But I do think that, uh, you know, using some of the tools that I mentioned in the, in the informal approach, you know, it, it's extremely simple. It's just Picking up, okay, how is Amazon entering India? What is Mintra doing to encourage growth? Like these are these are things that all of us are aware of. Uh, so that could be really the topic of of a case study. Uh, how a business is pivoting um, in in you know in uh, in the pandemic time. Um, you don't have to, you know, look very far. It's just things that are affecting, you know, ev everyday life. What is, what is, you know, the grocery store going to look like five years from now? Are we going to have reliance, uh, have so many chains that small, small businesses are growing? Like, you know, these are everyday challenges, really. Um, and so, so that's easy. That's an easy problem because we have this already and in terms of you know if someone wants uh, solutions to it it's just like it's looking at google there are so many tools that people like virtually every problem has an answer in google so using that as a starting point is also very helpful um, and then again coming back to the, the seven questions that i've identified and just thinking about it um, in a group setting um just uh just ensures that you you're you know it's a, it's a structured approach but it's it's an easy approach as well uh and it's something that as i said and i illustrated it's it's affecting our daily lives like businesses are everywhere um new companies are coming in all the time new apps tiktok 
it's it's a new idea you know it can be it can be very simply assessed using the exact seven frameworks you know that i said and like how we looked at uber so um i guess the short answer is uh, for the formal approach howard and iv are great sources but for the informal approach it's just picking a new app picking a business picking a new product that you're using and thinking about it creatively or critically yeah thank you for that yes we have one more question from uma student from indian maritime university her question is what are the key factors that prevents the case from being accepted for publication well quite honestly i don't know if i'm the best person to uh, to answer that question uh I'm not very familiar with, you know, the challenges involved in, uh, you know, in in publishing research articles um, or what you know criteria is. So unfortunately, I don't know if uh, I'm the best person for that. Uh, no problem, Chris. Uh, Miss Uma, I'll just keep you informed. We have uh, next two speakers. Uh, one, Dr. Geeta Rajaram, who will be at 11 o'clock, and Dr. Praveen Durai. Uh, who is author of a lot of case study books and his books are recommended to uh, Pearson and other universities in India. Probably we could share this question to him and he will share his inputs on that. Hello, ma'am. Can I ask a question? Yes. Myself, Dr. Konkona Bhagavati from Guwahati, Assam. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is for Chris. Uh, a very much thank you. Big thank you to you. It, your session was very informative. But I have a query in my mind that since my background is from accountancy, so will it be a little bit difficult for us to discuss the case studies in the class? Because if we go for discussion, we can give them more or less of sums to do in the class. So uh, I am uh, taking classes on the other undergraduate level. So what would you suggest on our opinion on that? So what I found in, uh, you know, in like, uh, in subjects like finance or accounting, or, you know, cost accounting and stuff like that, uh, I've noticed that there are case studies available as well. Um, yeah. Now, the case studies are not strategic like the ones that I've discussed, yeah, uh, but yeah. they they they're essentially, you know, create like. The, the problem is creatively presented and it's presented exclusively from, you know, an accounting or a finance perspective. So, for example, I remember doing uh, a case study. I don't know if you if you're aware of Enron. So Enron was a company in, in the US and they had a massive accounting scandal where, you know, their auditors were inflating their assets. Um, and it was being reported for years. So it showed like the financial statements of Enron showed that the company was doing extremely well, but reality was far from the truth. So okay. now that is an accounting case study. Um, mm. What it would involve is again, looking at some sample Enron accounts. This would all, I'm sure there are um, many case studies being written on matters like this, uh, where, you know, sample financial statements are, are available uh, as part of the case itself. And then the student, uh, you know, based on principles and theories I, is able to identifying actually, you know, based on these theories we see that five assets were inflated um, and mm -hmm. you know that's the approach to case study as well so um, you know you, you raise a very important question what mm -hmm. I uh, the tools that I showed were you know for strategic and you know general business and management exactly. case studies but there are uh, yes. specific focuses for accounting as well and or finance um, mm -hmm. and and those tools are available uh, what i what i think is in general when presenting any kind of a case analysis uh, just having a narrative so even if it's finance based where it's going to involve you know a lot of uh, number crunching um, you know fin taking financial statement samples showing what went wrong um, and then recommending alternative courses of action you know so it if, if, it, if it's the case of an accounting fraud that's being investigated 
validated. So the analysis would not involve a pestal, but it would involve just sample financial statements. But the solution will still be, uh, you know, having a more robust accounting practices. In the case of Enron, it was a legislative change where um, now the CEO of companies are supposed to sign off on financial statements. So, you know, um, I think what I was trying to get at was really telling a story. So any problem, whether it's finance or general business, uh, mm -hmm. is is best addressed when, it, you know, the, the problem is communicated well, um, the solutions are well structured, um, and implementation is well thought of. And, you know, these are like just some tools that can be applicable quite generally, uh, but specifically it would depend on uh, you know on the subjects and the cases that are available okay okay thank you so i hope i've answered your question of course of course thanks a lot thank you organizer ma'am thank, thank you, you. kankana ma'am thank you um i guess that's about the questions that we have before we wrap up um, this is an announcement to the participants in some time we will be sharing the feedback link in the chat section please do fill it up and in five minutes after the session we will continue on the same link google meet link with the next session with our resource person dr geeta rajara before we proceed uh, dear chris your presentation was very well structured simple and a detailed explanation was given case study analysis was well fragmented which taught us the fundamentals of case study method of teaching. In spite of the difference in time zones, we are highly appreciative and grateful to you for your time and efforts in joining us this morning as a resource person. Thank you so much, Chris. It was a fantastic, wonderful learning experience for us this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much.